Hey, Brambro here with some Grand Tactician Civil War. Our CSA campaign in the 1.06 beta. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is just kind of a... Kind of a response to uh, one comment. Uh, actually, a series of comments saying, Hey, um, you know, pick up a few things about the game as you go along. And... Uh, Here's some of the things I was interested in hearing described because I don't know what those are all about. Uh, I'm not going to go through an exhaustive uh, breakdown of the entire UI here, but uh, one of the things mentioned was hey, what exactly are all these things up here near the compass? Uh, this is pretty self explanatory. That's the menu where you save and exit and do options and things like that. It, these are the map information settings. Most of them are just kind of, they're, they're on by default, and frankly, the map would just look weird without them. <laughs> Let me turn this off. You know, things like uh, command and control. So this displays the rings, uh, it, well, it's normal. I'm not going to turn it off. So this one here, this displays the... Uh, the radiuses, radii, around the armies. So, for example, right here near Cincinnati, Covington, we've got Ewell's Corps. Click that. And that, and that shows not only his own uh, command radius, but his parent army commander's radius as well. Ewell's command radius is this circle here, the smaller one. But the Army Commander's radius, that's Sidney Johnson here, Army of Tennessee, that's the large one. And so command radius means it influences several things. Uh, one of them, for example, is for the Corps to draw supply from a supply depot. I think... I, th I think that the supply depot needs to be within the command radius. We're in the draw supply from that. I'm not 100% sure, but that seems to be about the distance at which a depot is too far away for, the, for that core to draw supply. If you zoom in a little bit further, each of these units also has a, well, I, interesting, the Army HQ does not because it doesn't actually have troops. But the smaller circle around uh, a corps or army that has troops in it itself early in the game, this is the combat radius. This is the range within which a battle will occur or a siege. Or if I wanted Yule's corps to build a fort or build a supply depot. He can only build it within his combat radius. So this button shows that. And so I can't really think of a good reason why anyone would ever turn this off. Uh, this is the movement arrows, you know, when you when you tell a army to go move somewhere and you see that arrow saying here's the route it's gonna take, this is the button for that. I'm gonna skip these for a second. Uh, military icons. These are the, you know, the NATO icon. I mean, to turn this off, and the, you know, the icons go away. I, I don't know why anyone would ever turn that off. Uh, map borders, same thing. Turn it off. You you lose the state borders, as well as the, you know, the colors showing this is a Confederate or a Union state. Uh, map text. Actually, when you're in close, you don't see it that much because it doesn't it doesn't remove the text for city names and and uh, IIPs and and unit names. But when you're zoomed all the way out, the map text is basically the state names. Again, don't know why anyone would ever turn that off. And then this last one here, 
This was a little strange to me. I was actually playing with it off camera trying to figure it out. And I can't see that it actually does anything. <laughs> what it says is map icons for buildings and infrastructure when pointing with mouse cursor. So it's by default on. And with your mouse cursor, you know, you hover over items on the map and it shows what they are. Like this is a farm. This is a factory. But you turn it off, and I still see the same icons, so I, I don't really know what that one's about. Okay. Now, now here's... I, say, I, I skipped over a couple because I think these are slightly worth talking about. By default, telegraph and supply flows are not enabled. And that's true every time you save and exit the game. When you load back in, they'll be turned off. Even if you had them on before. So it's kind of... A, I, you, I've mentioned it before in the campaign, but usually I just log on and... It's a habit to just go turn these on. Um, the telegraph line shows the telegraph uh, connections. And I like to have those on myself, so I always turn that on. And then the the other one is the supply flow. And this is the this is the map feature that shows you when you click on a unit, it'll it'll show where that unit is drawing supply from. It's not doing it right now because the game again when you when you load a new save and time is paused you actually have to run time a little bit for the economy and the supply and the flows and everything to just kind of get moving so right now i'm not going to see them but if i run time uh, a little bit we would see where yule is drawing his supply from and uh, that is shown by like a, a fat orange arrow, which actually will even include what the material is, like provisions or ammo. It's usually provisions, because when, it, when an army gets fully supplied with ammo and weapons and uniforms and that sort of thing, then it's stocked up. It doesn't burn those all the time, especially when it's stationary. However, even sitting stationary, an army is continuously using provisions all the time. It only uses the other stuff when it is moving, in which case it'll use forage for all the horses. And every, every unit has got horses. Even if there's no calf, they're still using horses and, well, and probably uh, ox, uh, oxen. Uh, for the supply wagons and ammo wagons and dragging around the artillery, that sort of thing. <clears throat> I would imagine that a cavalry heavy, heavy army or like a cavalry corps probably uses even more forage than that. I've never really... I mean, that would make sense. I've never really looked close enough to tell. Um... Okay, so that's those two. And then the other one is, by default, these battle icons are turned on. These battle monuments, which are just kind of historic. And you see we've got a lot of them here around Cincinnati. And, and I normally turn these off. And that's not because the icons themselves really bug me. They don't. But over time in a campaign, there tend to be kind of heavily fought over areas where there are multiple battles and these things just start to grow like weeds. In this campaign, that's happening a lot at Cincinnati. Um, in many campaigns, you start getting that kind of situation in Northern Virginia as well. Manassas Junction, Fredericksburg, this whole area just starts getting littered with the things. And again, with the with the actual icon themselves, eh, no big deal. However, each one of these also has a tooltip <laughs> saying, here was the Battle of Ohio River on this date, and how's, this is how many men were here. And uh, 
And since there tend to be armies in that area, a lot of times, you know, you get into you want to find something and you want to look at the tooltip for an army and then some stupid battle icon gets in the way. And <laughs> that, that's, why, that's why I turn those off. Okay, so there's a little discussion of the UI. Um, or those little buttons. This, this marker here, this is just the link to the field book. Which you can go th in through and read all this stuff about the game. There, there, you know, if I want to learn about upgrading weapons, you know, here's a thing in the field book. If I want to learn about officer attributes, here's a little thing in the field book. A couple things worth noting about this field book. It's pretty good. There's a lot of information in it. But... The first thing I want to say about it is it has not been updated yet for 1.06. Okay, so if you want to learn about economic stuff uh, in projects, that, that's not going to be in here yet. Uh, so I certainly hope that they update this uh, as 1.06 goes live. They've said they're working on it. The other thing to be mentioned about the field book is there's a ton of stuff in it, uh, and it, it's it's full of great information. It is not basically just the in-game reproduction of the game manual. Most of it is right. I mean, like this article here about attributes you're going to get pretty you know pretty much the same information in the manual however there are things in the manual that are not in the field book and so this is a lot of the information in the manual but it is not a complete substitute there is there is even more stuff in the manual than is in the field book i did not know that for a very long time and never looked at the game manual because of it I just assumed the field book was a 100% copy of it. It isn't. So read the manual. Uh, it, separate document outside the game. There is a link to it in, the, in, the, in Steam, both uh, from the store page for the game, and if you own the game and Grand Tactician is in your library, there's also a link to the PDF game manual there. Uh, some of the stuff that's in the game manual that is not in the field book or anywhere else in the game in tooltips or anything like that is uh, additional information on uh, weapons. There are, there are stats for weapons that are not shown in game. Specifically, the one that comes to mind that is the most uh, prominent is each weapon, right, like each rifle, has a firepower stat. And that's essentially that rifle's damage statistic. Okay, things like range and accuracy determine how likely a shot is to hit, and those are displayed in game. However, when there's a hit, the weapon does a certain amount of damage. That stat is not shown in a game, and that's called the firepower stat. And different weapons have different firepowers. Most infantry weapons have a kind of a standard value of one, but some are lower than that. Mixed muskets is lower than that. And then there's one weapon which is 1.2. It, it is more powerful than any other infantry weapon in the game. And that, somewhat surprisingly, uh, unless one thinks about it, is the regular smoothbore Springfield musket has a firepower value of 1.2. And that is because it is a large caliber weapon. I think it's higher than the others, 0.69 caliber. Um, and... I am not an expert on weaponry of the period, but apparently there's some kind of ammunition <laughs> that's called, quote, buck and ball, uh, 
which apparently was a combination of they had both a musket ball and some some buckshot like for a shotgun and they crammed all this into a single cartridge so when you fire the thing you're actually firing multiple projectiles almost like a big shotgun which uh cannot have been very accurate even for the smooth bore uh but when it did hit it it was pretty devastating and and that's reflected in the game by they gave the the springfield uh musket uh a 1.2 firepower so for that reason alone that you know they're still smooth bores they have crap accuracy crap range um but they are better than mixed muskets because they because ha- when they do manage to hit, uh, they, they do more damage. So that's just one example of some things that you can find in the manual that you cannot find in game, including this field book. Okay, what is this? This is just basically a quick zoom out to max zoom. You hit this, whoop, you come all the way out and uh, gives you the whole map at the highest possible zoom. Up until very recently, you had to come all the way out to this view for these heat maps to be displayed. Things like workforce, okay? Or intel, or market influences. You had to be all the way out at this view and and that's why they had this quick zoom out so you could get to that to use these filters. Uh, In 1.06, however, these are actually visible uh, further in. Like up until uh, a week or two ago, uh, if I zoomed in this far, I wouldn't have this heat map data anymore. Anyway, that's what uh, these buttons are about up here. Okay. Where are we at here? At the end of the last episode, um, where we fought yet another battle (laughs) in the Cincinnati area. This is becoming like the Stalingrad (laughs) of the the war right here. It's like neither side will give it up. And we keep going back and forth. And it's changed hand multiple times. Which, oh, by the way, I think is having a pretty bad effect on the IIPs in the area. Like, if we look at this port, uh, you know, recently occupied, transport capacity is still recovering, uh, 16%. (laughs) So, this port is pretty much just trash at the moment. Yeah, Lawrenceburg. Uh... 17% 17% on transport capacity uh, just from changing hands and all the fighting in the area which is probably pretty realistic so this whole area is just kind of depressed and war ravaged and yeah I mean that's what would happen right <clears throat> but we uh, so these armies here I don't think they're still retreating, but the Army of the Cumberland is in bad shape. This army should be in bad shape. West Virginia Militia was not in that battle, and last we had time running was actually marching down this way. So we'll have to keep an eye on what, uh, I think this is Winfield Scott, what he's up to. Further east, things are pretty quiet in Northern Virginia. You know, Lee's army remains sitting here, entrenched mostly. So do the Federals, though. There's 50,000 troops over here, and so, uh, you know, here Lee stays for the time being, including the Third Corps up at Winchester. Army of the Potomac isn't doing anything. We know what's going on at Cincinnati. Okay, here around Louisville, we're still recovering from the fact that uh, this army came down, assaulted Fort Gardner. Johnston's Corps 
got there in time to get involved in the siege, but I wasn't quick enough on converting that to a tactical battle. And his arrival didn't do enough to uh, change the uh, outcome of this. And so they took Fort Gardner, and Johnson's Corps is still retreating down to Harrodsburg, which for the moment, his morale is broken. Now to come back up, he's still within range of his army commander, right? He's still in telegraph connectivity, and if we look on here, his morale is 6%, um, but he's got a 14.8% morale recovery, and that's influenced by the fact that he's within range of the Army Commander, 9.6%. That's a pretty big morale recovery buff, and that's because he is a core underneath an Army Commander, and this is a good, uh, you know, I mentioned this several times, but... Uh, that's one of the reasons why, even if I have an independent army of only one core, I still like to put an army commander over them. That morale buff is one reason why. As long as I'm talking about that. Johnston can have up to three perks in his core. The army commander can also have up to three perks. So as time goes on, eventually you can get a core operating with the benefit of six perks instead of just three. That's the other good reason to have an army commander, even if you only have one core in that army. Because he, he'll get six perks, not three, eventually, as they get unlocked. Okay, so he just needs to get down here, recover his morale. Um, he's also getting a tiny bit just from being near that hospital, which is still at Louisville. Didn't know that there was a medical treatment uh, morale buff, but there is. It's not very big, but it's there. And it fighting, the fighting spirit of this army is capped at 97.4, which is pretty darn high. So he'll be able to get morale up nice and high eventually. But until that happens, he's going to just have to hang out and recover morale before we can go back over here and take our fort back. And as we saw in the previous episode, they just came down here and took the fort. You know, Louisville's wide open. He could have just walked into it. Didn't. He's headed back up the railroad somewhere, which I think is odd. <laughs> but the last intel report we saw, which is almost a month old, we're about to get another one here. Uh, the enemy posture is, is defensive. Well... Kentucky's a Confederate state. So I guess they just wanted the fort because the fort is on the Ohio side of the river uh, in, in, in Indiana. Whereas Louisville is a Confederate town. So I guess that's why he didn't come across. Maybe if he were an offensive posture, they would have. I think we're about ready now for uh, Hardy's army, which consists of Richard Anderson's corps. Been talking about it for so long. I think it's time to do it. We're going to. Uh, I'm going to move the core, give the corps order first. I'm going to come up and take Cairo, Illinois. And yes, please use the river to do that. And we'll move Hardy up as well. Not a very big core. 
but I do have additional units being recruited in Nashville. That's not it. Click the wrong one. There we go. Brag. These units will eventually move to Hardy's army and fill out uh, Anderson's Corps here. And they've got uh, eight days, eleven days. They're not too far. They're not too far out. And Price's army continues to sit in this area in southern Missouri. Which they've been inactive for almost a year, but uh, when units sit stationary, they're not completely idle. They're training. And the Missouri Corps has actually improved to good training level. So from a training perspective, uh, the Missouri Corps is actually one of the best trained uh, corps in the Army, and that has, that has come from uh, basically sitting around a lot. <laughs> so, you know, it's not a, it's not a complete waste for an army and, or a corps to sit stationary on the map for a long time, not getting bothered. Fighting, uh, or, uh, that training does also come from, uh, I, th I think fighting does improve it as well. And this core, which used to be hard, I forgot to mention this. I elevated Hardy to command of that army over there. And so when I pulled him out, I elevated uh, Forrest to command this core. So we got Nathan Beth from Forrest uh, as a core commander now. I know that'll make the Forrest fans happy. <laughs> and this is the only other core in the army that has reached good training level. Garnet might be there. No, Garnet is regular, which is one level below good. And all of, uh, in, in Lee's two, uh, now these armies have been sitting stationary almost as much as the Missouri army has, but they've only reached regular. Somebody was asking for a little bit more exposition on these little icons down here in the situation. So this one here, the star in the circle, that's the in range. He is within range of his army HQ commander. And as we saw, what that means is a uh, morale recovery buff. This icon is for telegraph. He's in telegraph connectivity. Uh, that reduces order delays, and there is also a morale rec recovery buff from that. This is kind of a new one. This comes from the hospitals, and this is uh, medical treatment. It's within range of a hospital, so uh, wounded recover faster, and a higher proportion of them return to service. And there's also a tiny little morale buff for that. Now, Longstreet's Corps, I think, is within range of two hospitals. So he's getting a little bit higher morale buff from medical treatment. And then this red one, this indicates the presence of unhappy troops. So that looks bad, but this is what's going on here. As units gain experience, they get more demanding of the quality of the brigade commander in charge of them. And it just so happens that during battles, when they get that experience, both the unit and the commander get experience from being in battle. And for whatever reason, the unit experience kind of outstrips that of the officers in terms of their happiness. So what happens a lot is a guy is in charge of a brigade. They fight some battles. The brigade does well. It gains some experience. So does its commander. But after a while, they get unhappy with them. The same commander who led them to success in those battles. 
and then you go, oh my gosh, I got to get rid of that guy. And then you go into the to the uh, view to go replace that officer, and you look at the guy, and he's fine. <laughs> like he's he's got stars and leadership and everything all over the place, and you know he's better than any possible replacement you can come up for him, come up with for him. So I just kind of stopped paying attention to it. And it turns out, if you hover over this morale and get this morale tooltip, the actual percentage uh, of the morale buff is usually very low, right? It's 0.5% compared to all the buffs from all the other green icons. So this usually is not something to worry about until you get like 10 or 12 brigades or something and even I'm it's not a big deal is all I'm trying to say I mean it's kind of irritating from an immersion standpoint but it, this really has very little gameplay effect let's just look at these guys now in this case I think some of these officers in this core I did remove because I promoted them to divisional commands or even core commands elsewhere right so some of the early proven leaders from this core I did remove and put them elsewhere but uh, who was it it is and it tells you in this tooltip who exactly it is this is an army wide there's two brigades the first brigade and the third brigade First Brigade is unhappy with Ramser, and the Third Brigade is unhappy with Gardner. If we actually go look at them, that's this guy. Yeah. So this guy, uh, this brigade, they've reached five stars because this force did fight a lot early in the war, and this brigade was in the thick of it. So they, they are maxed out. They are a veteran brigade. They, they even unlocked their perk slot, and they're working on their... Uh, second tier I I could I could take na name a general I could take Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or Napoleon Bonaparte put them in command of this stupid brigade and they wouldn't be happy with them <laughs> it's just the way it is and Ramser is not bad uh, three in initiative he's got two and everything else um there's no reason to replace them. But the two attributes for a leader that factor into this, initiative, admin, and cunning don't matter. It's fame and leadership. So he doesn't have much fame yet. That's that's the main reason they're unhappy with him. Um, so, but, you know, only three stars between those two attributes. And the fame will come as they fight more, if this army ever fights more. And then Gardner's the other guy. He's solid. There's no reason to replace him. And the morale... But even if I had, like, three stars... And if, if these guys were three stars and everything... These units probably still wouldn't be happy with them. Right? Four stars. Five stars. I could take Lee... I can't do it because Lee's too senior to command a brigade. But I could take somebody with Lee's stats... Or uh, Longstreet stats, right? I could put I could put Longstreet down and charge this brigade. I I don't think they'd be happy with him. Okay. Well, I've talked enough about all that stuff. Uh, I think we got a couple projects available. Already talked in a previous episode. I'm just kind of not doing policies and acts for a while. I'm waiting for chapter three before I proceed on to more stuff. Everything that's available right now in policies, um, I think their downsides outweigh their good sides, upsides. Or at least they're a wash. So I'm just not doing anything right now. I've got all the policies I want. I don't like any of the acts that are available. For projects... We've got some um, 
presence in southern Indiana and Ohio, and we're about to have a little tip of Illinois. I had turned down politics subsidies because I kind of got all the administration reform. I want. Matter of fact, the fact that I took this administration reform so that we could reach research policies and acts faster has kind of gotten me into this situation where I've run out of things to research and I'm sitting twiddling my thumbs on the policy tree for several months. So I'm not even 100% sure it was worth doing this. I don't know. Uh, but I, So I turned down policy subsidies for a while. They'll go up again as we start taking more policies in Chapter 3. But at the moment, I'm not... I'm just going to go ahead and take one of these. Do I want to reduce enemy support? Or do I want to increase Confederate support in those states? Well, I'm not looking to go and conquer, uh, completely occupy all of those states. We're only holding on to what we have because it's important for control of the Ohio River and uh, Kentucky IIPs that they happen to influence. So I think I'm more interested in reducing enemy support in those areas. I'm going to go ahead and take this. Mainly just because... I don't know what else to do with the political subsidies that I have built up. And we've got enough economic subsidies to do another level of market reform, which will increase the efficiency of our nation's markets, which in turn means uh, increasing the effectiveness of our transport capacity, which is what markets supposedly do. <laughs> so we'll take that and see if we see any increase in our capacities when we get time rolling. We've got enough ag subsidies to take anything we want, but I think instead I'm probably going to take either another plantation or maybe another mill. I'm saving ag subsidies for buildings. I'm doing the same thing with uh, industry, so I'm not taking infrastructure reform or subsidized industry. And for military subsidies, I took the organization reform and the and the Confederate gunboats. Arguably, not the best thing I could have done, but I'm saving back up to now to start working again on logistics reforms. Okay. Navy stuff. Previous episode, we moved our mid-Atlantic blockade to this position off of uh, Cape May, and yeah. We have six Union ports blockaded, several in southern New Jersey, and they're doing a decent job. Uh... 23% effectiveness on these up here. Which is not bad for just the little ragtag collection of uh, little steamers that we have in this fleet. I'm not going to put big warships in these. Mainly because I only have one force of big warships and I have other plans for them. And the reason... And yeah, Baltimore and Annapolis are just within his range. Now these are actually getting blockaded a lot because... See, I can't... There we go. 73%. That's because our main battle force, the Battle Squadron... I renamed it to Battle Squadron because he's going to start operating a lot farther away to other places than Hampton Roads. He's still blockading... Now that these guys are up here, I'm going to turn blockade off on this guy. And looks like he needs some coal. So for the moment, I'm just going to send him back down here to Norfolk to restock on coal. Once he's got the... And he only needs coal for one ship, for the Virginia itself. Every other ship in this fleet are sail frigates. They don't need coal. 
To be honest, I don't know if that really matters. But when he gets this coal filled up again, he's going to come on down here to Wilmington and chase another blockade fleet away. Now, the earlier idea that I had about going against blockade fleets was I would have some little fleet with steamers go into raid mode and go attack them first to drive their readiness down. And that's what this fleet here did. Raid Ron 1 uh, to clear the Chesapeake Bay earlier in the campaign. I'm not sure I need to do that. So I think what I'm going to do with this force is rename it and we're going to send this guy up to be our New York blockading squadron. I'm calling it Sandy Hook blockade because that's where he's going to park right off Sandy Hook. And actually, he's still got a couple of uh, ships that are repairing, so I'm just going to pull these back into the back into the pool. And I think I've got a couple of captured ships that are available that have been repaired from earlier battles. And actually, they are still called USS. Need to fix that. The names are fine. I just don't like the the USS. Okay. So they'll catch up eventually. Meanwhile, we're just going to move this fleet up to Sandy Hook. It's not shown on this map, but here at the entrance to uh, Lower New York Harbor, there's a big kind of sandbar. A, a spit sticks way out here. Anyone who's familiar with the geography of New York knows this. And that spit is called Sandy Hook. That's why I called it that. I'm just going to park him right that. No. It's, I want to make sure we're, we don't get too close and get engaged by that fort. Let's, let's go more like this. <laughs> That'd be better. Yeah, let's stay away from Fort Tompkins. That fort would eat that little fleet up alive. It is often remarked, justifiably, that in this game forts are dubious in value because the AI will march right up to them. And sometimes the fort will actually hold off that a much larger army for a a long time. I have even seen a fort defeat uh, like a ten or twelve thousand man army. That doesn't often happen. If the AI marches up to a fort and besieges it, yeah, the fort will hold out for a long time, and sometimes they'll even win. Uh, had a fort win uh, a siege like that in my last uh, campaign on YouTube. If the AI marches up and assaults the fort, it'll hold out a, a couple of days at most, and, and then it's just gone. And that's what happened to us over there at Louisville with Fort Gardner an episode or two ago. So forts are kind of dubious... I, you know, as a, as a real fortification, um, occasionally they'll actually hold out and win. Most of the time, they do not. Against land forces. However, forts sitting on a river or on a coast, if an enemy fleet blunders too close to them, yeah, forts will tear up naval forces. Something fierce. A really, really strong fleet of all 
the big seagoing vessels like frigates, steam frigates, um, uh, even ironclads, they will eventually wear a fort down. But even then, they will lose ships doing so. And it will take quite a considerable length of time to do it. So land forts against, you know, land forces, yeah, they're, they're pretty sketchy. I still do them sometimes, like this one at Winchester, because it does provide a little bit of a speed bump and it'll delay uh, an enemy force long enough to run a fleet up, uh, run an army up there uh, to relieve it and then force a tactical battle, which is what I was trying to do at Louisville and I was just too slow to get to the tactical battle. I should have watched that closer two episodes ago. But against naval forces for controlling rivers, yeah, forts do a lot. Like over here, whenever one is playing as Union, you're not getting fleets up past Fort Donelson, Fort Henry, and Fort Hyman on the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers. Not until you build... Um, a, a no kidding big ironclad river fleet that's got enough combat power to wear them down and even then you're going to lose ships doing that so for that reason here soon when we take Cairo I am going to put a fort right about here just as added insurance to ensure that Union forces don't come down the Mississippi and start playing havoc with all of our gunboats. Okay. Well, after me blathering on and on and on, I think we're finally ready to advance time and see what happens. Yeah, this is like a whole... Oh, nope, he is coming back to Louisville after all. Nope, he's... What are you doing? Oh, he's getting on the river. Okay, meet my gunboat. Let's see what happens here. See if the pattern continues. Boom! Yeah. Nope, he's still coming, though. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. No river for you. Get out. That's my river. <laughs> of course, he'll be able to just march past it. Wonder where he's going. Is he going to Cincinnati? And we're going to have yet another Cincinnati battle. Oh, he crossed the river here. Okay, so maybe gunbones don't prevent crossings. And where is so? Where is he going though? <laughs> Beckham's engineers are in fine supply shape. They just haven't fully recovered all of their provisions yet. The flow is fine. And this is what I, yeah, here's that. He's drawing supply from up here, Covington. So he'll get his provisions back. He's just still low at the moment. However, he's obviously not going to be doing anything against the West Virginia militia. How's Johnston? Okay. So Johnston's morale is already coming up. He's merely panicked now. So a pretty obvious move is just move one of uh, Johnston's corps down here to fight the West Virginia militia. I don't know that I want to leave just one corps at Cincinnati, though. 
I'm not saying that the AI is smart enough to do this, but the way it's working out is that West Virginia militia is kind of feeling like bait. <laughs> oh, and 32nd Army is... No, that... No, he's, he's in Ohio. That's fine. I thought he had gone across to West Virginia. Excuse me. Western Virginia. It's not West Virginia. Option two would be let Johnson's Corps come up higher in morale and then go fight Scott. But that just pulls him further away from Louisville, which is where he actually needs to be. It's interesting. Is he coming down here to cut my supplies? Cut the railroad? If I move Yule down, he's still going to be within command radius of Johnston. So still within reinforcement range of Hill and vice versa. Oh, Hill's got unhappy guys, too. Two brigades, Brown and Sims. Whatever. Okay, Anderson's Corps moving up the river to go take Cairo. Hardy's already there. It's just him, though, so he's not... Actually, he is capturing. Zero <laughs> percent, though. It'll go extremely, extremely slowly. No, I'm just going to move... Uh... I'm just going to move these engineers further out of the way. They're not going to do anything against that force. We can move down here by Johnson. I'm going, to, I'm going to move Yule down by rail. And we'll be fighting here somewhere near Lexington. What? What? What was that about? Oh. Officer rehabilitated. Wonder who that is. Morgan. I don't even remember Morgan being defamed. Maybe he was a cavalry commander. That broke in a previous battle or or is Morgan in Johnston's core no I was thinking maybe if he was in Johnston's core maybe he got defamed because of that retreat like an auto resolve def but no 
I just don't remember that guy getting defamed. Anyway, he's fixed now. <laughs> Which, if I don't remember that, it means I may have just left him in command of that brigade, despite being defamed. Well, because of that weird little glitch up here, Yule didn't catch, uh... I think this is Winfield Scott. That's okay, we'll catch him here in a second. There we go. Yeah, it, Winfield Scott's still in command. And even though they're way up here at Cincinnati, because of the Army HQ structure and the large reinforcement range, uh, Hill's Corps is still going to be in this battle if it goes to 24 hours. I don't think we're going to need Hill's Corps. I think Yule could do it on his own. But, because of all the jibber-jabber that I did through most of this uh, campaign map-only episode, that is going to have to wait for the next episode, this battle near Lexington. If you like what we're doing with the channel, you're enjoying the campaign, then uh, leave a like, leave a comment, maybe even subscribe. But at any rate, thank you very, very much for watching. I appreciate it.